Good evening. Uh, my name is Lynn Hollander Savio, and on behalf, behalf of the Board of Directors, I want to welcome you to the ninth annual Mario Savio Memorial Lecture and the presentation of the eighth Mario Savio Young Activist Award. Many of you come to this event year after year, and we want to thank you for your loyalty and your willing to, willingness to put up with a certain amount of repetition. To those of you who are first timers, a special welcome. We hope you will find tonight an interesting and worthwhile occasion. This event is brought to you with the assistance and support, both financial and otherwise, of many departments of the university, and we want to thank them for all their help. The UC Library, the Graduate School of Journalism, the Goldman School of Public Policy, the Graduate Assembly, and the Free Speech Movement Cafe have all been tremendously helpful to us as they are every year. We depend on their generosity, and we also depend on the generosity of individuals like you. If you're a struggling student, you can still afford a cup of coffee or a cookie out in the lobby. They've been donated by the FSM Cafe, and they only cost a dollar. For those of you with a little more money in the bank, we would certainly appreciate a contribution, which you can either give to the coffee sellers or mail in. You can get brochures with the address from the refreshment table or from the ushers as you leave. At least I hope you can get them from the ushers. Um, things get a little chaotic around here. Uh, the speakers for this event do not receive the huge lecture fees which most of them are able to command in other circumstances. And people who are on our board who do the work leading up to this evening receive no pay at all. In fact, they don't even get reimbursed for their transportation to board meetings. It's all a labor of love, so please help us out to the best of your ability. This year, I would like to introduce the people who currently serve on the board of directors so you can learn a little bit about the guilty parties. Um, we are not really a secretive organization, as some people have accused us of being. Um, our newest member, but also our oldest, because he took a few years vacation, is Nadav Goldberg Savio. He is our website designer. <laughs> Probably just for speed, we can skip the applause till the end. He's Mario's middle son, is my stepson, and best of all, he is co-producer of Elias Owen Savio, 11 months old. So, we were also joined this year by Colin Raja. Colin, where are you? Okay. He is coordinator of the International Migrant Rights Program at the National Network for Immigrant and Refugee Rights. From Sonoma State University, where Mario worked for many years, we have Elaine Sunberg, who is Associate Vice Provost for Academic Programs and Graduate Studies. Another board member is Mark Randazzo. Mark, where are you? There he is. Okay. The coordinator of the Funders Network on Trade and Globalization. Next is Steve Silberstein. Steve? Okay. He's a graduate of the library school here who worked at the library at Berkeley for 10 years, whose software is responsible for the automation of over 1,000 libraries worldwide. And he is the person who, among other donations, gave this campus the Free Speech Movement Cafe. Finally, from UC Berkeley, we have two board members and a member in waiting. First. Professor Waldo Martin of the History Department. And next, Manuel Vallet, who is a teaching assistant and doctoral student in sociology. Finally, 
The person who will replace Manuel, if he can ever complete his graduate studies, <laughs> Anu Joshi, the president of the UC Student Association. Anu, where are you? Oh, she's way in the back there. Okay. She's the president of the UC Student Association and the legislative liaison for the UC Berkeley Graduate Association. I thank them all for their work and their support. And Finally, I would like to thank the helpful staff here at the Student Union and also this evening's volunteers who are captained by Karen McClellan, most of whom help out year after year. We truly appreciate all your work. Now, each year at this point, we show a very short video to acquaint people with, or recall to us, the man whose life we celebrate, whose death we mourn, and whose ideals we rededicate ourselves to on this evening. I had some doubts about showing it again, because in some ways, the last segment of the video seems dated. Mario speaks about the closeness between the students of the 60s and those of the 90s due to the persistence of the same issues on the progressive agenda for those groups. These days, when the war on terrorism seems to be the only thing other than tax cuts for the wealthy that is on the national agenda, his remarks should remind us that none of those issues have gone away. They have only become obscured by the admittedly serious problems created by religious fundamentalism from various sources, including a faith in unbridled capitalism that actually I thought was ended by Teddy Roosevelt. It's important, I think, that we listen to Mario remind us, as Hurricane Katrina did for an all too brief moment, that there are a lot of other critical problems that still need addressing. So, here is the video. make some public statement to that effect. And the answer we received from a well-meaning liberal was the following. He said, would you ever imagine the manager of a firm making a statement publicly in opposition to his board of directors? That's the answer. Well, I ask you to consider if this is a firm and if the board of regents are the board of directors and if President Kerr in fact is the manager, and I tell you something, the faculty are a bunch of employees and we're the raw materials. But we're a bunch of raw materials that don't mean to be, have any process upon us, don't mean to be made into any product, don't mean, don't mean to end up being bought by some clients of the university, be they the government, be they industry, be they organized labor, be they anyone, or human beings. There's a time when the operation of the machine becomes so odious makes you so sick at heart that you can't take part. You can't even passively take part. And you've got to put your bodies upon the gears and upon the wheels, upon the levers, upon all the apparatus, and you've got to make it stop. And you've got to indicate to the people who run it, to the people who own it, that unless you're free, the machine will be prevented from working at all. But today's rally in front of Sproul Hall has taken on a different tone. Several thousand students have gathered for what has been billed as a victory celebration, a victory the students feel is assured as a result of yesterday's action by the Academic Senate. We're asking that there be no, no restrictions on the content of speech save those provided by the courts. And that's 
that's an enormous amount of freedom. And people can say things within, within that area of freedom which are not responsible. And now that's, you know, we've finally gotten into a position where we have to consider being responsible because, you know, now we have the freedom within which to be responsible. And I'd like to say, well, at this time, I'm confident, I'm confident that the students and the faculty, University of California, will exercise their freedom with the same responsibility they've shown in winning their freedom. I had a very bad stammer, um, the worst stammer that I absolutely have ever encountered in anyone. I stammered for years very, very badly um, in high school, you know, right up through high school. It started to subside um, on the last day of high school. You know, that the, uh, you know I, I delivered the valedictory, I stumbled on the first word and the rest came out smooth. And then thereafter, over a period of a couple of years, the stammer gradually, gradually disappeared. An unusual pattern. So for me, I mean, I, I've, I've read about, you know, who wouldn't have read about stammer? It's quite a, it's, it's an, an unusual pattern. Now, um, to me, in addition to its political meaning and its, you know, moral and philosophical meaning, the free speech movement uh, was a pun. My free speech movement, uh, freeing up the movement of my, you know, my speech movement. And so I was also very much uh, sort of deeply, viscerally involved in the idea of free speech. I, I have to say, um, for me, the sort of the deepest free speech quote for me, is uh, what uh, Diogenes is attributed, uh, you know, what is attributed to Diogenes. And he said, the most beautiful thing in the world is the freedom of speech. And those words are in me as they're sort of burned uh, into my soul. Because for me, free speech was not, uh, was not a tactic, not something to win for political. To me, free speech Freedom of speech is something that, that, um, that represents the very dignity of what a human being is. Um, if you cannot speak, I mean, that's what marks us off. That's what marks us off from the stones and the stars. Okay. You can speak freely. That is, if, uh, it, it's almost impossible to describe to me. It is almost possible for me to describe. But it, it, it is really the thing that marks us as just below the angels. I don't know. I, I don't, I, I don't want to push this beyond where it should be pushed, but I feel it. We knew people from 30 years ago when we were students, and we were, not, we were not that close to them. Their issues were not that close to our issues. But the issues that we fought for and developed over the 60s and the 70s, and mostly the 60s actually, are the issues of today. We actually are closer to students today. Um, the agenda, the national agenda, is the agenda that we created. What is that agenda? Okay, you can put it in the, the simple version is it's anti-hierarchy. But what does it mean? Anti-hierarchy in race, anti-hierarchy in gender, anti-hierarchy in class, anti-hierarchy in the environment. It's not one species, uber alles, right? Anti-hierarchy in the empire, not one nation, uber alles. Those five, actually, that's the, that's the five that Cornell West is happy to, to name. One could, you know, name four or name six, but there they are, okay? Race, gender, class, environment empire. That is the agenda that we began the creation of, and that is today's agenda. I believe people have a desire. I think there's actually a desire for solidarity, for seeing things from the other person's point of view. And I've seen it many times. Um, trade unions who are very, very hard bitten, and they all, you know, say, was that a good contract? But on the line, the enthusiasm on the line is tremendous. Where does that come from? They're doing something together. So they're, they're doing something, it's not, just, it's not just against the bosses, it's with your brothers and with your sisters. I've seen that happen. Um, and I believe there is a, a deep hunger that people have for doing right by one's brothers and sisters. And so there may be like a hidden reservoir that works for us. That's, that's almost like a faith, okay? And, and you know, in other words, how can I prove that? Well, I prove it if we finally win.
in addition to presenting a well-known speaker each year, the Board of Directors has one other equally, if not more important, task. That is to choose that year's winner of the Mario Savio Young Activist Award. This award carries a cash prize that is now up to $5,000, divided equally between the activist and his or her organization. It is given to a young person with a deep commitment to human rights and social justice and a proven ability to transform this commitment into effective action. The recipients should demonstrate leadership ability, creativity, and integrity. This year's winner of the Mario Savio Young Activist Award is a 22-year-old college student from Denver, Colorado, Aaron Durbin. Aaron, Aaron currently is program director of the Youth and Militarism Project for the American Friends Service Committee in Colorado, a program which she co-created. It is the first program in the state to address the poverty draft, the lack of meaningful alternatives to military service for youth in poor communities. Aaron also developed a youth activist conference to provide training for young people in the skills necessary for activism and is developing a metro-wide network of youth service and advocacy organizations. Aaron's work for the AFSC is an out outgrowth of her leadership in the student anti-war movement in Denver. As co-founder and head of Anti-War Auraria, a tri-college group, Aaron organized, emceed, and spoke at the 2002 Student Walkout and Rally for Peace, the first student action against the war in Iraq in Colorado, which drew 700 participants, which is a remarkable number for a, com a commuter campus where students do not spend much time on campus. She has continued to organize on campus against the war with rallies, a peace camp, and leadership in the Colorado Con Coalition Against the War in Iraq, which has more than 80 organizations participating in it. In all of these efforts, her nominator reports, she has struggled and won against a campus administration which has tried relentlessly to shut down student war student anti-war activism. Erin has also worked to address the unconscious racism in the largely white Colorado peace movement. Erin began her career as an activist at the tender age of 14, a year after coming out to family and friends as a lesbian. When she started participating in struggles for gay rights, as well as campaigns for economic, racial, and environmental justice. As a high school student in Tucson, she resurrected the moribund Gay Straight Alliance and Diversity Club, increasing its membership from two students to 40. As club president for three years, she led a successful guerrilla campaign to have contraception available at the high school clinic organized participation in the National Day of Silence Against Hate Crimes, and initiated a no hate speech campaign, leading a workshop for the faculty on addressing the needs of gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender students. The no hate speech campaign spread to the entire Tucson Public School District and is ongoing to this day. In addition, Aaron was a co-organizer of a 1,000-person strong march against hate crimes in response to the stabbing of a University of Arizona student and worked as a facilitator and organizer with Tucson's GLBT youth program, speaking to youth and community organizations about coming out and other issues. But from the beginning, Aaron's activism was not limited to matters in which she might be seen to have a personal stake. 
As a volunteer and keynote speaker for the Southern Arizona AIDS Foundation, she worked to reduce the invisibility of people with AIDS and provide SDI pre prevention training and outreach for youth. She served as an officer in the Alliance of Students Against Poverty, organizing fun drives, food drives for the homeless, and working at the homeless shelter. She organized resistance to an anti-bilingual education proposition, which, although it passed on a statewide basis, was defeated in Tucson. As an officer of Girls Against Garbage, a campus environmental group, she developed a school recycling program and worked with the Desert Museum in restoring the desert ecosystem. At Metropolitan State College in Denver, one of three colleges in the Auraria Consortium, Erin has continued her leadership on GLBT issues in addition to her anti-war activities. Last year, for the Metro State College new homecoming celebration, Erin ran for homecoming king <laughs> to raise awareness about gender stereotypes. Her selection as a finalist <laughs> created a great stir and discussion on campus, with the planning committee eventually changing the two honorary titles from king and queen to roadrunner royalty. <laughs> she has also had a major responsibility for the Take Back History Columbus Day protests in Denver. You might not believe this, but I have actually omitted a number of the specific activities in which Erin has participated, including the Feminist Alliance, the Colorado Anti-Violence Project, and on and on. Another of her nominators stated, in the time that I have known her, Erin has been involved in a leader role with seven different campus organizations and five community organizations. Unlike many who spread themselves so thinly, Erin actually does much of the work in each of these groups. She is a doer, not a slacker. And her former supervisor noted, Erin is not just a star figure, she is also in the trenches. In a long letter, she wrote, even with 10 pages, I couldn't do justice to the quality of her character, the inspiration of her vision, the truthfulness and integrity of her spirit. In both the range and the depth of her activism, Aaron Durbin truly could give voice to the well-known words of Rabbi Hillel, if I am not for myself, then who will be for me? And if I am only for myself, then what am I? We are delighted to present her with this year's Mario Savio Young Activist Award. Definitely a privilege to be here, and I wasn't expecting quite so many people. It caught me off guard, definitely. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, I, I'm, I'm really honored that you're all here to honor Mario Savio's legacy, because I think the work that he did is really important. And so I'm glad that you came here for the speaker tonight and, and to do that. Um, I was thinking on my way over here um, from Colorado about what I planned to say once I got to this spot. And um, it's easy for me to talk about the things that I'm passionate about, whether that's feminism or anti-war work or youth and militarism, 
But it's a lot harder for me to talk about my personal journey as an activist, which is what I was asked to speak on tonight. Um, in fact, it's something I've never done before, at least not publicly, um, even though I, I mull over you know, the reasons why I got involved in activism. So hopefully I can inspire people to get involved in the things that they're passionate about. Um, writing the BART last night, I was thinking about, um, you know, the models of acceptance speeches that are out there. And the only thing that I could come up with are acceptance speeches at award shows like the Grammys and the, or the, um, yeah, the Emmys and the Oscars and the Golden Globes and the MTV Awards. And... I, I'm always too disgusted to watch the inaugural addresses of the president. Um, <laughs> at, <laughs> at award shows, though, I remember countless people, especially women, recounting in their, ad in their addresses to the audience how they had um, watched the red carpet shows as a child and the glitz and the glamour of Hollywood. and. Um, then they finally came to this spot after dreaming about it for years and years of becoming a big star in television or the movies. The, um, of course, they said this before going on to thank their director and the Academy and on and on and on. And um, I, I was thinking that for, for activists, there isn't a comparable event. <laughs> that the Angela Davises and Jose Ramos Hortas of the world are not recognized or celebrated or held up as role models to the same extent as the Brad Pitts or the Britney Spears or the Angelina Jolies. And I was thinking that Mar or peacemakers like Mario Savio and Wangari Mathai, the recent Nobel laureate, um, along with people who work for change in their communities by doing something as simple as planting an urban garden are not venerated in this way even though they're the people who should be in our society. <sighs> so, as a kid, I didn't have dreams of becoming a big star, but I did... Um, I, part of my dreams. I wanted to become a pilot like Amelia Earhart. I wanted to become a teacher like the people who had created safe spaces for me in their classrooms. And sometimes I even thought of becoming a professional pirate like in fairy tales, except without the parrot because they freaked me out a little bit. And um, I didn't dream of becoming someone who dedicated to my life to peace and social justice. And even as a kid, I, I could have maybe named one or two people, Martin Luther King being one of them. And when I, I worked for um, an organization called Peace Jam in a mentor capacity, and they go into classrooms and ask youth you know, how many people can you name who do peace and social justice work? The person who runs Peace Jam said the most that she's ever come across in a college classroom is seven. And that's devastating. <laughs> um, and, I, and like I said before, we need to have those people out there. We need to hold them in those positions. For me, activism is a process that happened naturally and gradually and not particularly gracefully. <laughs> um, the process started with small efforts in elementary school to get my neighborhood to recycle or to donate um, items to the local women's homeless shelter. In fourth grade, it was deciding to do a presentation on the slave trade and the conditions of indigenous people while the rest of my class was celebrating the 500-year anniversary of Columbus landing on the shores of the Americas. In this instance and many others, I was fortunate enough to have been raised in a diverse community where the lives and stories of people I knew contradicted what I was learning in the classroom and gave me insight into the workings of the world. This, along with an image of the way I wanted everything to work, informed my activism throughout this time and later in high school and college. 
Each of the instances I've talked about, and including the work that Lynn mentioned, is tied together by identifying a problem that affected my family, my friends, or my community, which I define pretty broadly, including the world community, and feeling compelled into action to do something about it. This is the very basis of activism, and it's something I believe is hardwired into my system. All of my efforts as an activist, even the small ones from my childhood, built on each other until I can no longer see myself as something different from the work I was doing to create change, which sounds like a psychological complex, but it's a very um, important part of my identity to be doing this work. And it, it feels bizarre to be honored just for who you are in some ways. Um, as I learned about, more about the world and the extent and entrenchment of problems like poverty, racism, militarization, and patriarchy, the work has grown with me. In this day and age, it seems impossible not to be what some people call multi-issue activist, because really, the, although the manifestations may di be different, the issue for me is the exercise of power and basic human dignity. This is the reason three and a half years ago I created the Youth and Militarism program in Colorado. This program addresses the social and economic justice aspects of the militarization of youth. The program conducts trainings on youth empowerment and anti-oppression, or anti-hierarchy. And our focus is countering the poverty draft, which is targeted military recruitment in low-income communities and communities of color. This is done in part by debunking military myths, conducting education about militarization, and getting viable alternatives into communities hit hardest by institutional oppression. Sometimes this includes direct action. Currently, we're doing this work in more than 75% of Colorado schools, as well as schools in New Mexico and Wyoming. The Youth and Militarism Program is the largest in, cent in the central U.S. working on this issue, a geographic region that draws the majority of new recruits in the United States military. We serve as a resource to people in this um, region and elsewhere in the United States to work on demilitarization, anti-oppression, and youth empowerment in their communities so we can build a sustainable, mo er, sustainable movement to do youth and militarism work. <laughs> Through the years, I've sought out fierce and revolutionary peacemakers who came before me to help guide this work and the rest of my activism, challenge me, and be the inspiration I was missing on the TV screen and the history books of my childhood. This includes Corky and Nita Gonzalez, Glenn Morris, and Troylan Yellowwood, to name a few. But it also includes people my age and younger who have dedicated their entire lives to sustainable social change for peace and justice, such as Jess Ward at the Peace Jam Foundation that matches up youth from around the world, everyday regular youth, with Nobel laureates. These are the people who, if given the choice, I would place on the red carpet to serve as examples to the next generations that change is possible and that they can be instrumental in that change. I am extremely honored <laughs> to be the recipient of this year's Mario Savio Young Activist Award, and thank you very, very, very much. Racking up to be up here without the papers. Mario was a great spontaneous speaker, but I am not. <laughs> so, um, okay, uh, let's see where we're at right now. Um, okay, before um, I have a brief announcement, a couple of announcements actually. Uh, first of all, there are some tables out there besides a refreshment table from uh, groups, the Project Censored table, um, and tables about uh, campaign financing, and uh, 
uh, fiat light, is it? The demilitarization of the campus. So please, before you leave, uh, get yourself a cup of coffee and take a look at their materials. Secondly, uh, there were some file cards put on the ends of rows uh, on the aisle seats. If you think you want to ask our speaker a question, please take one. Uh, towards the end, someone will come up the aisles and collect them. And Rob Gunnison, Rob, could you raise your hand? Uh, collectors, that's where they go to. Uh, and Rob is going to sift through them and ask those that he believes are of general interest. Um, now, here is Nadav Goldberg Savio to introduce our speaker for the evening, Seymour Hirsch. I need the paper too. Seymour Hirsch is an investigative journalist. Uh, in fact, in my mind, he's the investigative journalist of the last quarter century. Uh, he's broken stories on the CIA's domestic spying on political activists, on the massacre of Vietnamese civilians at My Lai, uh, and most recently on the abuse of prisoners of war at Abu Ghraib. And there are many, many, many others. But it's less the number of stories he's broken and more the types of stories that make her so important. He manages through patience, intelligence, and force of will to uncover things no one else would or could. And then he presents them in all their ugly detail for the world to see and understand and judge. About 15 years and a couple of careers ago, I read Hirsch's book about the My Lai massacre and subsequent cover-up and was so taken with the idea of turning the light of truth onto the dark side of American power that I began a relatively short-lived career as an alternative journalist. I dutifully covered protest marches uh, and called up corporate PR flax and kind of tried to sweet-talk them into telling me what their uh, you know, employers were up to and so on. Uh, it did not last very long. The irony of my story is that Sai is not only the person who inspired me to be a muckraker, but he's also the reason I stopped. You see, while I was working as a reporter in DC, Sai agreed to meet with me to talk about my career. Sai being Sai, it took about 10 minutes before I'd spilled all of my secrets, and he was satisfied I had nothing else whatsoever to tell him about anything. But what I realized meeting him and seeing firsthand his toughness, seeing how dogged you really had to be to doggedly pursue the truth, I realized that I am just too soft to be a good reporter. <laughs> Cy Hirsch is many things. Soft is not one of them. He's not thin-skinned. He's not scared to piss people off. And as it turns out, much to our civic benefit, he's really, really good at pissing off the right people. Which brings us to tonight's talk. Now, Cy Hirsch is a very different person from my dad, Mario. He's belligerent where my dad was gentle, pulls no punches while my dad was strategic, and is best known for his written words while my dad is known for his speech making. But there's something about Cy that reminds me of my father, and I think it's that what he does seems to come from some deep, almost compulsory need to bring the truth out into the open, and to not let the powerful escape the judgment of those in whose name they govern. And along with this truth-telling, they share a faith in the intelligence of their audience, a willingness to present the facts as they see them without distortion or oversimplification. With all this in mind, I'm very, very pleased and deeply proud to introduce Seymour Hirsch for this year's Mario Savio Memorial Lecture. This is the happiest you're going to get. That's all I can tell you. He's an old family friend. You should know that. Friend, good, dear friend of one of my children. And um, um, 
it is interesting what you said made me think about something which is um, I, 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 th I thought a lot today about where your father would be and what he would be doing and how frustrated he would be because we're in a different place now. It seems the 60s and even he lived through the Nixon years. Um, we had presidents that responded, horrible presidents that responded to public opinion. We had a man named Lyndon Johnson who quit when he, when he didn't do well in an election that he actually won against um, Eugene McCarthy. We had Richard Nixon terrified. We now know from the tapes about the anti-war movement. We have a different situation now, and it's a much tougher one. And um, uh, I don't know what he'd think about it. Um, I think th the bad news is, just to get, get it on the table, there's, let's see, roughly 1,180 days, give or take one, in the, Nixon, in the, Bush, in the Bush presidency. That's 1,180 days to go. The good news is, Tomorrow morning when we wake up, there'll be one less. But, but you, you got to get beyond that. And let me tell you, let me just talk about the critical issue, of course. We could be saved. Fitzgerald, you know, America's a funny place. People come up. We have a, um, a Congress, particularly the Senate Armed Services and Foreign Relations Committees that basically a Democrat and Republican that take your choice. They're either supine or prone, but they're down at any given time. We have, we have a Democratic Party that's completely bankrupt. We have a former president that can't bring himself to speak out against the war. Uh, I'm talking about Bill Clinton. And you know, um, you got to give the guy his due, as I always say. I always do remember one thing about Clinton that is that, you know, to give him his due, which is that um, um, we don't want to, you know, you're talking to the guy who wrote about me lies, so I'm not going to get too much into institutional racism in America, but it is true, and I always say this, that um, Clinton, by bombing uh, in Yugoslavia in the middle 1990s, was the first American president since World War II to actually bomb white people. <laughs> it's just a fact. It's just one of those terrifying facts that speak a, <laughs> it's just one of those facts you know we're we're now in the there's so many analogies between this war and and uh, the Vietnam War we, we have soldiers who uh, there's a difference in Vietnam we had a draft and now we're having a Praetorian army nobody here can is gonna fight we have it's whereas in Vietnam uh, Robert McNamara who was basically in my definition a pathological liar matched only by, by Kissinger. You don't want to know why, where people come from, um, where I come from. I, I, don't, I don't know what drove your father, Nadeev. But um, where I come from is real simple. Um, don't like lying. Don't like it in my personal life. Don't like lying to children. Don't like my children lying to me with the exception of teenage girls for a couple of years. You have to be realistic. <laughs> Some realism. But anyway, essentially don't like lying. And essentially know that you get along in life and you have a, a relationship that uh, with, with a significant other, a partner, um, that's based ultimately on trust. And we also know that uh, we all love our country. We're all very adamant about our country. We, we believe here, everybody believes it's as much ours as it is theirs. And we're loyal in that sense to our country. And what we expect in our family, in our personal life, what we demand We've become, we've, we've learned, we've, we've adjusted, we've become a nerd in the same way as Bush is a nerd to us. We've become a nerd to this reality, that the men and women who make the decisions at the top of our government do not share these values of truth and honesty, do not share the same values. That we, know, we, don't, we understand that they don't tell the truth and they lie. That they, we have had presidents, we've had the Pentagon Papers, Dan Ellsberg who lives in this neighborhood, I'm sure many of you have heard speak and the importance of those documents because they're a written record of the lying that took us both from Kennedy and Johnson into the war. And we've had the consequences of all of these actions and the continuing by Nixon. And, you know, Nixon has claimed he ran in 1960. I worked for Eugene McCarthy in 68. And Nixon won the election over Humphrey by claiming he had a secret plan to end the war. And of course, his secret plan was to win it. You know, that was his plan. We've had this all along. And we have this incredible sort of institutional, it's a bad deal for the commonweal, that we don't begin to in demand of the people at the top in the government what we demand in our own personal life. Nothing unusual about it, what we demand all of us around the world. But we have this anomaly in our, and so what I do, 
Uh, I don't know what Mario did. What I just do is say, hey, I'm just going to hold these guys to the highest possible standard. So here we are. Let me tell you what's going on in the war right now. Let me tell you what's going on. And it's, it's the best day we had in Iraq was yesterday. It's not going to get better. It's going to get much worse because it's the only way it can go. I don't see an end because we have a utopian. We have a, ut a misguided utopian. We have a president who's doing what he does in the belief that somehow he's going to bring democracy. I don't know whether it's because he's talking to his God. I, I don't know whether it's because he's avenging something his father did. But I will tell you this. He is absolutely serene and committed to this war, and he's not going to stop. 2,000 body bags. If there's 2,000 more, it doesn't matter. He believes, and he's told people, that maybe it'll be 30 or 50 years before everybody fully appreciates um, his genius in bringing democracy to the Middle East. And the neocons now in the, in the White House, in, in the Washington, I, I talked to some of these people. They're now talking five to seven years of horrific war, but we will win whatever winning is in Iraq. So here's what we have right now. We have a, a perfect trifecta in reverse, in a way. We're going to have a, a Shiite regime in the South. This, the government of America, the elephant in the room is always Israel. It's always Israel. But the, the, the Shiite regime in the South is going to be even, it's going to be totally dominated, pretty much dominated by Iran. There's no question the Iranians have an enormous amount of influence. The real winners, if there's such a thing in the war that we started, is Iran. Um, um, that society of Cyrus the Great, which is not going to give up its nuclear weapon. And we'll have to talk about that. That's to me, is the most frightening future prospect. I don't know what's going to happen there. Common sense says nothing should. But common sense said we shouldn't have gone into Iraq either. Um, in the north, we're going to have clearly the two parties, Barzani and Talibani, who don't like each other, are going to get together and create a Kurdistan, the new constitution, which was approved about a week ago Saturday. We'll talk about that in a minute. Pretty much guarantees it. Basically, there's going to be some sort of a referendum in Kirkuk, the oil area, that, that, that they want to annex. And it's going to be, oh, turn off cell phones. Somebody forgot to tell you. Please, let's just wait and turn them off. Um, anyway, demographically, um, it, the new constitution simply says, which isn't worth, I mean, you all know it's just, it's, it's basically a domestic document. You know, it's not going to change anything. They, they mitigated it before. And by the way, just to tell you what you don't get in the press is, do you remember the quietest day they had that Saturday? Well, there is an insurgency that's terribly controlled. It's indigenous. It's not full of jihadists. There's a certain percentage, but it's basically a Sunni Baathist insurgency with enormous control and discipline, they shut down that day. They shut down because they didn't bank the people that are telling you that the, the election was fine and two provinces voted against it in Mosul, where there was all sorts of allegations of voter fraud and systematic voter fraud, um, the Constitution carried. What, the, what, what you don't know is the insurgency talked, the, the United Nations is also there. Um, and going to, um, in some sort of electoral commission to approve the results. We haven't heard from them. But the UN, so I understand, and what I'm telling you now is stuff that I'm, 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 I'm on top of a lot of things. I haven't written this, so I have to make that demonst it's, it, I'm talking currently about what's going on. And I, this hasn't, it's, it's not Im empirical in the sense that it's not in written word. So there is a caveat. But essentially what's happening is the, the UN has always had much more contact with the insurgency. Um, you understand we have a president you know, in any group of three-year-olds, when there's a fight, it seems to me the nursery school always tells people you must talk to people you're fighting with and talk to them. We have a president who doesn't talk to the Iranians, he doesn't talk to the Syrians, and he doesn't talk uh, to the insurgency. Um, those of you, many know the Vietnam War, many here are well uh, as, as old as I am. Some of you on the floor, are, which is pretty, I don't know why, nobody gives, nobody gives seats to people anyway? <laughs> I guess not. It's the free something movement, <laughs> free seat movement. Anyway, um, <laughs> um, the, uh, uh, where was I? <laughs> yeah, okay, so uh, talking about the, I, I don't want to get back, I want to get back on the main track, but what happened with, in, in, in the case of, uh, uh, in the Sunni heartland, um, as I say, there was tremendous control, there was contact with the United Nations, there was an understanding, uh, Simply put, some people in the UN, there was, it was a clear notification. We gave you the quietest day we've had in two years in this country. We did it. We didn't do it because you threatened us and you made gestures, the Americans. We did it because we wanted this to, we wanted to, we wanted, the only solution rational people had, if you're really going to try and do something about that country, would be to defeat the Constitution because it guarantees civil war. It's a Constitution in terms of the Kurds. 
is a constitution that says Kirkuk's going to be decided by demography. And in the last year and a half, as all of you probably have read, there's been pretty much ethnic cleansing. Saddam started it. There's no brief for Saddam here. Saddam began by ejecting the Turks and the Kurds and putting, putting um, uh, Arabs in there. But um, now they've replanted, they've kicked out the Arabs, and the population is pretty much over, well over 50% Kurdish. So they can, under the Constitution, there'll be a referendum. They can probably annex it. And at that point, um, in the South, you're going to have a Shiite regime dominated by Iran. Uh, that's probably going to be more hostile to Israel than it would have been otherwise. As I say, the Israelis are always uh, in the room. In the north, you're going to have a Kurdistan that is going to annex um, Kirkuk. And I will tell you what, what, what the Turks will do. Um, go ask a senior Turkish general or colonel, uh, what do you think about Kurdistan? And they will look at you and they will say, not all of them, but m the majority of them will say, oh, there is no Kurdistan. It's not going to happen. You could have a very serious war that could bring Syria into it and Iran even to it up north. That's another possibility. In the center, what they call the Sunni Triangle, the four counties, the four provinces that the war is going on right now, uh, there's a bitter, horrible fight to the death going on with the Americans taking an enormous lead in it. And basically, if you name the city Samara, Fallujah, Talafar, it seems to be a pattern of we're going to go take down them city by city. The goal is to make the Sunni heartland more frightened of the insurgents than us. And what's the secret word? What's the secret element in this that you never read about or hear about? It's bombing, American bombing. The bombing has been a steady factor in the war. We fly F-18s out of carriers, Marines. Marines are flying out of carriers in the Gulf. There's no embedded reporters, no embedded reporters in our air bases in Doha. It's an un in, in the Vietnam War, we were told every day how many sorties, how many sorties per day, how many missions, how many tons. Um, I knew at the time of Fallujah, if you remember that battle last fall, when we, the first major assault, Samara was also, but this was a more violent assault, assault by the Marines with a lot of air. At that time, it was clear that the bombing had gone up exponentially. There's no air defense in Iraq. I mean, it's what they call a turkey shoot. They just go and bomb. And uh, it, I was told during Katrina that there were some people, some of the people in the military, their job is to fight and win the war and kill the other guys, kill the ragheads. Um, I was told that um, there was some happiness because so much attention was diverted. So much attention is diverted anyway. It's five Marines die one day, five Marines die the next day. It's always it's become a footnote story. It isn't much less significant. And I was told that they were ecstatic because they could increase the number of runs. Uh, you talk to people who serve on the carriers, um, airmen who serve, and they said, every day another boatload of bombs would come. We were just flying missions. We don't have a quantifiable number. But I will tell you, it's the ticket out. And this, again, I'm just being, I was talking to a class earlier today. I'm sort of being heuristic about it. I can't, that's, um, that's an Ellsberg word. I learned it from Dan. Um, anyway, um, by that I mean, um, here's the ticket out. You had a con the Constitution me is meaningless. It's a, it's, a, it's a guaranteed formula for civil war, sectarian war. And what you're going to see in the next, the, the guess is really probably outside of the green zone, that area that we claim to control, the most powerful force uh, in Iraq is undoubtedly the Iranians. And what you're going to see eventually, when the other side decides to do it, the insurgency decides to do it, you're going to see the battle for Baghdad. And um, probably uh, um, one of the things that's going to make the battle more uh, come along more quickly would, will be what they call in Arabic the stretching of the neck of Saddam. Because once, he, once Saddam is killed, is hung, um, which I think he will be, and I think certainly uh, um, the Shia very much want to, um, and so do we. Um, I think, you know, like any abusive father, you know, any abusive father, we, you're all frozen when you have an abusive father. Somehow it's a freeing thing when an abusive, really abusive father dies. And you're going to see, particularly the Mahdi army, the, the Mahdi army, the, the army that controls uh, Baghdad, the Maqtada Sadr army, you're going to see them begin to move more openly with the Sunni against us in Baghdad. And Baghdad, anyway, my friends, my, my friends talk to people on the other side. You know, in 1965, if you'd gone in America and you'd said, you know, it wouldn't be such a bad idea to talk either to the North Vietnamese or the Viet Cong, the Vietnamese communists. Do you remember that? Oh my God, that was just a no-no. Bobby Kennedy raised it in 66 and it was an outcry. How could he dare it? And of course, that was the only solution. I don't know if it's still viable. They're still there. They're a significant force. They were very upset, the Sunni leadership, by um, 
um, by the fraud that took place in the election and by the fact that it was a one-day story for the American press. If you remember, you read about it a, a day or two afterwards, there were allegations of fraud, and, but you know, it just disappears. You can't really bring the reporters there. There's no way to be a legitimate reporter there. You can't move. Uh, anybody who seriously wants to do reporting and get out is, is, is walking to a death trap. The country is that, that dysfunctional, certainly for a Westerner. And um, even the Arab, as you know, the Americans target many of the Arab reporters because they see him as potential allies of the insurgency. And of course, the basic reality that it's sort of, I, I state it, many of you here know it, but you, you, I, you know, it, it's amazing how many don't. I just spilled water all over myself. Feels good, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> the basic point is, we're fighting a war against the people we went to war with in March and April of 03. We're fighting the Ba'athists and the Sunnis. We're in year three of the war. I have a lot of general friends who say to me, we're not winning it. Um, we may not be losing it, but we're not winning it. And you know, it's Mao that you know, all these great proverbs about in a guerrilla war, you know, you don't have to win. You, uh, you win by not winning. Um, we're fighting the same war, the same people, that 20% of the population who are very dedicated. I, um, I think you'll see we've been cheated out of a lot of history. We thought we won the war very handily when our, our army, you know, the Third Army, rolled into Baghdad unopposed. And um, what we now know, and I think we even knew then, um, there's a history that's been written that, won't, that the Fifth Army Corps in Heidelberg, which controls the Third, third Army's part of it, has done a history that they have not declassified, refused to. But anyway, the point is, it, it's pretty shocking. It's a, a incredibly abusive to General Franks who was described, you know, the great hero of the war, who along with uh, uh, um, General Sanchez, Ricardo Sanchez, two pretty dumb generals we had going there. They weren't, they really didn't know what was, what was going on. They were fighting um, a, a war of, of terrorizing people. Anyway, um, uh, what happened is we knew before the war that Saddam had made uh, Baghdad into a do or die. He had put his, he had a couple of secret units, not secret units, a couple of units that were his personal units, the Special Republican Guard, you haven't heard that word in years, something else called the SSO, and we knew from intelligence, overhead and other things, every major street corner had blockades and sandbags and soldiers. You could see large quantities of clips, they had machine guns ready. It was going to be a fight to the death. On the night of April 6th or 7th, um, our signals intelligence people, we were a lot of competent people. Hey. Most people want to do their job right, almost invariably. And again, uh, I think we might all be thanking God for Fitzgerald. He just may be, he may save the Republic if he does what the rumors say. I don't know, I don't know, no inside story except uh, um, uh, it's going to be interesting. And um, it, it could start reversing a process that, you know, it is a pretty fragile democracy we have. Eight or nine neocons come in with an agenda and they take it over and the agenda says that we're going to go from what most Americans consider to be a legitimate operation going after you know in Afghanistan going after the people bin Laden the people that f that fly airplanes uh, into our buildings to kill infidels us going after them was perfectly rational for most Americans and somehow three or four months into that George Bush decided that the the road to stopping international ter terrorism led to Baghdad and after and began to move assets about in camera um, secretly and that decision um, is is one that will be as we all know will be judged incredibly harshly uh, by history and also it defies you know the extent to which the the small group of people there was a, a retired officer last week a State Department official former marine colonel that used the word cabal Wilkerson which I was very pleased to see because that's my definition of these people is is, is even harsher than that. And I was telling a class today about Shinseki. Let me give you an idea what these guys, where these guys are. Shinseki's the general that a month before the war announced publicly at a hearing, told the Senate that two, two to 300,000 troops were needed. And of course, everybody went crazy. Wolfowitz attacked him and Rumsfeld made him a lame duck. He appointed another general uh, to be his replacement. Uh, right there, he, was, had, he had another year to serve as chief of staff, the highest job in the army. And, and, and uh, Rumby announced another guy named John Keane to be his replacement. By the way, a year later, Keane did not take the job, but nobody picked up on it. He just, for whatever, I assume for reasons of ethics, he just wouldn't do it. Uh, but at that time, 
the idea was, my friends tell me, it wasn't about the numbers. It wasn't about Shinseki, about the numbers. One of my friends inside, one of my people who knows this group, and I'm, I'm lucky. I was long of hair, been around a long time, and, um, um, and I am a reporter. I'm, I'm a reporter first, and I, you know, I, 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 there were things, I probably know things you would think I should write that I don't. You know, I don't like to write about ongoing, I don't like the, certain things, I don't like to write about ongoing operations, et cetera, et cetera or passive collection stuff, you know, when the NSA does stuff, sometimes it's good, sometimes they break the rules, which they are now all the time, but that's a footnote. In any case, so the thing about Shinseki was, it wasn't that he said we need 300,000 troops, it was, didn't he get it? Hadn't he been in the tank, the JCS meeting room, where Wolfowitz, and Wolfowitz is sort of, as I've said many times, the, the real Trotskyite of this, of this movement. He's the intellectual, he's the believer in permanent revolution, permanent chaos. <laughs> he's, he's the heavyweight, and with Pearl, they're the heavyweight thinkers of this crowd. Anyway, but in the tank, hadn't he been there when we said all along, my God, before the build-up to the war, the neo-composition was, neo was five, um, um, the, the, the point of view was 5,000, 10,000 soldiers, a lot of American flags, some bombing, some special forces, Saddam would fall easy, democracy would flow like water into Iran, into Syria, into Lebanon, into Saudi Arabia, the world would be safe for Israel, for oil, There'd be a new democracy, a new world vision, and hadn't he seen it? It had been, as somebody said to me, it like he'd been, if you remember the cult of two, two or three decades ago, like a depro deprogrammer had gotten him and deprogrammed him, and that was their issue. Somebody else said to me, a very serious military general, senior officer, hardcore guy, he said, he said, he was talking to me about it a year later, about Shinseki, we happened to start talking about it. He said, no, no, Sai, you gotta understand. I told him what another friend had said. He said, no, you gotta understand. They thought Shinseki was a witch. They just, they really did. We're out there with these guys. These guys are not susceptible. We have a president that's a utopian, that's a believer, that's a radical, that doesn't have the information, is immune to change, is immune to being told you're doing it the wrong way, can't work. He's immune, he's got a mission, and he's gonna do it. I don't know how we stop him. I don't know what we're gonna do. Um, it's a little bit out of control, I think. It's, 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 you know, if that's funny, I don't know. You guys are into some stuff. Because it's not funny to me. Because I don't think he, we certainly can't get him with the press. And look at, when you talk about democracy, to get back to that point, look what happened. These guys come over and they say the, right, the way to go, the, the road to stopping international terrorism leads to Baghdad, huh? Everybody goes, huh? Secular Baghdad, which had no use for jihadism, just as Syria has no use for jihadism, always been secular. Um, bin Laden, bin Laden wanted to go fight. Saddam in 1990, when Saddam went into Kuwait, he ran back home from Afghanistan to see, the, see King Fahad and begged for permission to get there. I mean, quite the contrary, what everybody thinks. <laughs> and um, uh, we have this, we have these guys, we have, as I say, a supine or prone Congress. We have a press, we've been reading about the New York Times, but it's not about Judy Miller, it's about the New York Times, much more than Judy Miller. Don't get fooled by it. It's, it's, well, you know, the press's job is to protect us from this. That's one of their jobs. And, you know, they, they got to get it pretty much close to a D minus on this. And it's a very serious issue because that's, you know, they have a constitutional obligation. That's what the Bill of Rights is all about. Um, the military failed, the Congress failed, the bureaucracy failed. And here we are stuck in, you know, in, in with 1,180 days to go back to Vietnam. Let me tell you what happened. So, um, the signals intelligence people, our NSA, on the night of April 6th to 7th, 2003, they tell us something's happened. We're tracking a lot of sat phones. There's no, they don't have, they don't have uh, uh, cell phones. They have sat phones there and other devices. We're tracking a lot of phones, a lot of people, 6,000 people we think disappeared overnight. We don't know what happened. It just disappeared. Our army moved in, no opposition. Um, Saddam clearly went into a guerrilla mode, into a cell structure probably emulating the Dawa party, which is a party that are op operating out of Iran, an anti-Saddam party. They tried to kill him a few times. Every time he captured somebody from Dawa in the 80s and 90s after an assassination attempt, he could only get two or three people out of them. They were so closely, they were all, nobody knew anything but the only immediate unit they were in. So he set up, um, uh, there was intelligence reports about it. There were American intelligence reports. He set up a two or three tier structure of, with small cell units. We could hear him, we could hear him. We, later on, we could hear him, but we couldn't find him. We still can't find him. We have no idea. 
So it's going to be a battle for Baghdad. It's going to start, and we'll know when. Uh, it's probably going to start in the green zone because, you know, that's where they think most of the intelligence thinks. We certainly know it's penetrated. So you're going to see some messy stuff come. Uh, you know, will it be another Tet? Will it have an impact on the American society? Probably. We're looking at 70% against the war. Will it impact on the policy? I'm not sure because, as I say, there's a disconnect between what all of us think. 70% have a lot of problems with this war. It's not just, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know how we're going to break through. Anyway, so we win. The statue gets pulled down. Um, uh, May 1st, the president lands on the carrier, et cetera, et cetera. In the summer, we start seeing stuff. Um, hits. We start seeing sort of almost crazy operations. A bunch of guys will just start throwing themselves at American soldiers, start a firefight in which they're all going to get killed. We immediately rush reinforcements. This is June, July, and all of a sudden the reinforcements are hit real hard. They know the people who started this operation knew there would be a second American res They knew the response before, before we did. They knew what we were doing. They were tracking us. Rumsfeld began talking about dead-enders. There's 5,000 dead-enders in, the, in, the, uh, in Iraq that we have to deal with, you know, Saddam, pro-Saddam guys. In the, and it goes on like that in the summer of 03. In, in August, um, the UN gets hit. Remember that? 42 killed, the, the, that wonderful man who led it. Um, we also see this. We also knew in real time when the people, when, when everybody in, in Baghdad cleared out in April, on April 6th to 7th, right before we went in, all the, all the corner battles, all the fights we thought would happen did not happen. We also know that the top layer, the intelligence reported that the top bureaucratic layer across the board disappeared. The guys who ran the postal system, the guys who ran the health system, the guys who ran the waterworks, the guys who ran the oil works, the guys who ran the city structure, the, barack, the, the, the core issues, the core things that make a city and a state work. The top level disappeared, the leadership. So in August, we not only have the UN hit, we get the Jordanian embassy hit, and that gets everybody's attention. Because um, there, the Israelis, there are 4, 400,000 Iraqi Jews. Many of them left Iraq during the Saddam years and even before because of obvious re reasons. Many went to Israel, many went else, other places. But Israel has a very powerful, strong role inside Iraq. They can move people in and out. They have the language skills, they have the, they have, they have the knowledge. And one of the focal meeting, one of the focal places they would interact uh, with the, our intelligence services and others were the, in the Jordanian embassy. The Jordanians have always played that role, that middle role, and with Mossad and others. And so we suddenly see the Jordanian embassy get hit, and that wakes up people's attention. And then also in August, the waterworks get hit and the oil works get hit, not so much in overt pipes, but in pumping stations and underground facilities. And it's very clear that people have blueprints and in the opposition. And it's more organized and it's more systematic. We now roll into September. I'm going to tell you about the chain of command. I'm going to tell you who's responsible for the horrific stuff that's being done every day in the name of all of us to, these, to people around the world with impunity. Um, to this day, with total impunity, the United States operates the world is simply our terrorist playground. We can snatch anybody, anytime, any place, take them anything you know, where the sun don't shine anywhere. And we can do it with people in, this, in the government. We can do it with people off the books. We can do it with private companies we hire to do it. It has not stopped. It's gone on more, what they call renditions. You know, four decades ago or three decade ago, decades ago in Brazil and Argentina, that was a course you know, called disappearing people. And um, it goes on and on. Congress hasn't been able to stop it. It's not interested. It's not afraid to take it on. It's unbelievable that this is being done in the name of all of us, and it's carte blanche. And you know, we, all, we don't know enough about it. But in any case, in September, panic in River City. Karl Rove was involved. What are we going to do? This war is going on. We're a year before the election of 04. And so the decision is we've got to get more intelligence about the insurgency. We can't find them. We can hear them. We can hear them click, clicking along. We're pretty sure Iranians have produced some of, and probably did some, some signals intelligence stuff for them. So we can hear it. We know they're there. We have no idea when they're going to strike or where they're going to strike. So let's get more intelligence. We now know that in the prison in Abu Ghraib that Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International, which have been reporting and screaming about these places for a year and a half to nobody paying attention, after all, you know, there's no pictures. Um, um, they estimated eventually 90% of the people there had been caught in random roadside checks and, you know, the way it works is if, if an American's attacked, we run in every house around and any mail we, in the buildings around there we grab and, and lock up for interrogation. It's pretty much random. 
Officers tell me, young kids that serve there tell me the biggest problem they have, of course, is keeping the kids away from the people. Because when you, when you don't have any contact with them, we're not fighting an army, we're fighting a guerrilla war. There is an analogy with Vietnam, the same issue. They never saw the, you know, the, in Vietnam they used to say the Viet Cong were farmers by day, guerrillas at night. But you never, you're, you're riding your trucks along, you're, doing, you're going along driving your trucks and down the same road or your tanks and eventually you get blown up and eventually you think that those kids who waved at you a block before knew what was going to happen. So eventually you want to hurt them. So the young kids who care, and again, you can't say it enough, you know, to talk about the failure of the military leadership. Are, are, the, the kids who serve, are the, the officers are in local parentis. They're the mothers and fathers. They're keeping them not only from bullets and bombs, they're also keeping them from themselves. Nothing as dangerous as an uninformed kid with a weapon in a war zone. And so the failure is so colossal, even though you have to, in all fairness, you have, there's not been a mutiny. You have to admire the tenacity with which they're fighting, our boys. Um, um, I, I don't blame them. This is much higher level. But in any case, so the panic's on. We've got to get intelligence. It's September. And so let's start jacking it up. Out of this comes, we all saw Lindy England. You know, I hope you read enough to know that she wasn't, she was basically not, not capable of much independent thought, uh, very tied with this, tied to one of the guys in the unit by, with, by whom she had a baby, um, not very independent. Um, and, um, this is a group from the 372nd Military Police Army Reserve Unit in, in located in rural Virginia and West Virginia. They attracted people from. These are the people, the kids there may have had an enormous amount of innate intelligence, I can't say otherwise, but they certainly were not particularly educated. Uh, Army Reserve for them meant uh, a few extra bucks to do maybe some junior school, some beauty, beauty school, some just some more bucks to get along. Night pizza managers they were. And they were trained not as military policemen in terms of prison guards, they were trained to be traffic cops. And they were sent to Iraq to do so. And uh, got a few weeks training in late summer as being prison guards, sent into the prison. Um, by late September, the games are on. The Abu Ghraib games that you saw, September, October, November, December. This was a very focal point for the American op operation. We had to get intelligence. Everybody went through in these three months. General Sanchez, the three star in charge, all sorts of people. Every senior officer went through. And military intelligence were all over the place. CIA were all over the place. American Special Forces, SEAL teams, CIA teams, and Delta Force teams. We, they bring in certain people. They would snatch and bring them in for interrogation. Um, I, I proffer to you that a bunch of kids from West Virginia, and, and Virginia did not know that, um, uh, that in the Koran, uh, it is totally shameful. It is against the Koran for a, ma a male to be seen nude by another male. In the Koran, it's almost a, a, a taboo, like, uh, like Freud's uh, taboo and totem. It's almost a taboo to, uh, to engage in homosexual practices, uh, although certainly, of course, it happens. But it's a, in the Koran, it is. And, and did these young children know it? I, I don't know. I, there's a lot we, we, we talked about and answered, but in any case, let's go on with the story because there's something that it's interesting that, that I missed the first time around. In January, four months after this stuff starts, one of the kids goes in with a CD. They're passing the photographs around. Goes in with a CD and gives it to the cops. The military police take a look at it and they go, oh my God. You know, um, uh, I have a friend, an Israeli friend, who's as tough as they come, Mossad, good German. I have my secret theory about the, the Israelis, which is, yeah, they may have taken Eichmann and put him on trial, but I, I wouldn't have wanted to be a German uh, who was uh, connected to the SS rolling around Europe after, after Israel was established. I think they did a lot of whacking. But we, you know, we'll, maybe will or won't learn about it, or maybe I'm wrong. But my friend um, saw me six or seven months after I did the stuff on Abu Ghraib in Europe somewhere. And we, we had a sandwich, and he said to me, you know, I hate Arabs, and I hate Palestinians, and I want to kill them, and they want to kill me, and I've done bad things to Palestinians. But let me tell you something, Hirsch, she said. I know that we're going to have to live with these no good people at some point, whether there's a wall or not. We're going to have to share a border with them. And if we had done in our prisons what you had done with this sexual stuff, that wouldn't be possible. Do you know what you did? This is a Middle Easterner. And so in some cases, some of the people, when they saw the art, the photographs and the, and the, the, the discs, understood in January. Rumsfeld testified in one of those pathetic hearings uh, that later that 
He was told about the, the problem by January 20th, and within two days he told the president. He said then he didn't see the photographs, no reason to doubt him, uh, but he knew it was serious. And so we move on. In late August, late uh, um, April, CBS, I know, has some photographs that are exciting and great, and I also know, I learned from people at the Hill back, the, cha the, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs that told them not to publish them. I guess the assumption of the United States is the Iraqi people didn't know what we were doing in, in uh, Abu Ghraib, I assure you they did. <laughs> I had a, uh, in, um, in December of 03, um, I, I spent, one reason I'm so skeptical, I was so skeptical all along about the, the WMD stories, I'd done a lot of work in the UN, um, uh, partly beginning with Scott Ritter and his travails in 1998, but through him I met some of the people in the UN peacekeeping mission and the arms control mission. We're talking about very, there were two kinds of people from, from Australia, from um, England, from Germany, from Russia. You had operators, the most skilled operators, you had great intelligence analysts, they were really competent people, very bright some of the MI6 people that worked there, and I read their reports. And if you read the UN reports, if you'd read particularly the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency, Jacques Bout, ran a, a Frenchman, ran a team called the Action Team. If you read their stuff, there was no way there was anything there. So anyway, so I had, I, I through those guys, I, I got to know a lot of Sunni generals who were in the army at high level with Saddam, who didn't like Saddam, didn't like the insurgency, but didn't like us, and there they were. Trying to, most of them have gotten out. Half a million people alone are in Syria right now. Half of them are Christians. The other half are total supporters of the regime, of the insurgency, anyway. And so this guy, over Christmas of 03, at the same time the games are going on, right before they were, somebody uh, turned the photographs in, he's telling me about Abu Ghraib one afternoon. I spent three or four days just taking notes. And he said it was so bad there, he said, that the woman in the prison, there were a wing for the women, were sending messages home to their to their fathers and brothers and say, please come kill me, I've been defiled. And we're not talking about rape by the Americans, but American GIs will play grab ass and mess around and take photographs of the, of the woman in showers and stuff like that was enough. It's a society based on shame. We operate out of guilt here. Um, you know, you, you know um, go into a locker room in a men's club in Egypt and every man showers separately. You know, not like, you know, the stuff in our, in our locker rooms. You know, everybody's slapping around with towels, whatever the cliche is. Um, so, um, somebody in the Joint Chiefs that tells, that we're back now in April, late April of, of 04, tells CBS 60 Minutes 2, I guess it was, that you can't do it, they don't do it. And so, at that point, I, I'm a nice guy, I've been helping him, I say the hell with it. I, I knew where this report was. Uh, by this general Antonio Taguba, this born in the Philippines, uh, two-star general who wrote the only report of Abu Ghraib that was never meant to be published and that was devastating. It was the first report just eviscerated. Obviously he felt something and I guess being born in the Philippines I think helped him feel a sense of outrage at the treatment. So I write the stuff, go along, the president announces, and it's a big flap, the president announced in May that my god I'm against terrorism. Condoleezza Rice tells the press at a briefing the president, she literally says, I, the, trans, the transcript is, was made available later. At, at, at the time, I think she was just called a senior official, but the transcript was made, she was given the briefing. She was the national security advisor. She said, look, she said to the press corps, the president made it clear he's against torture. I guess the army didn't get the message, right? So we go along, by late summer, all of a sudden, that dawns on me how screwed up I was in what I was thinking, and we all were, because in my business, what you can't see, what doesn't happen, doesn't exist. You know, it's, 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 and so here's what I didn't realize. What did President Bush do between January 20th or 25th, let's say, when he learned about Abu Ghraib and the first public report? The answer is nada, nothing. Did he call in Rumsfeld and said, I demand an investigation. This is unbelievable, unacceptable. We're fighting a war. Did he call in? Did he demand that they replace all the people? Did he demand a full-scale investigation? Nothing. You want to know the chain of command? You got it right there. I mean, this is what, this is the great failing. It's hard to see something that doesn't happen. Um, I'll tell you why, I'll tell you a couple, uh, this is going on forever and I want to do some questions, but I'll tell you, um, um, you know, when I did the My Lai stuff, the kids in, in My Lai, for those of you who don't know, it was one day in, there was a company named Charlie Company. And what I'm telling you it sounds fanciful, but it was totally real. They went to Vietnam in late 1967, 
And in the next three months, they, watched, they marched around in, in, in one of the combat areas in the north, northern part of Vietnam, close to I Corps. They marched around, and they never saw the enemy. But they lost maybe 20 guys out of the 100 through snipers, um, through booby traps. And they were more and more angry, and they would begin to act out a little more with locals, and their officers weren't stopping them. And finally, one day in March of 1968, at the height of the war, uh, 500,000 Americans then, they were told, tomorrow you're going to fight, you're going to meet the, uh, the North Vietnamese battalion. We have intelligence that there's going to be 500 North Vietnamese soldiers there. Get ready. So the kids did what that army did. You know, they toked it up, and the officers and enlisted men drank it up. And 4:30, they jumped on choppers, and they went to die and be kill and be killed. Walked into the village. I don't think it was called Mila. I don't think they called it Mila. They they called it Pinkville because it was pink for communists on the maps. They walked into this village. And they flew. And they dropped off outside the village, and they stormed in. 550 some odd is the number, best number. Women, men, women, children, old women, old men, making breakfast. And over the next three, four hours. They put him in the three ditches and they shot him, executed him. And one of the kids that did a lot of shooting, at this point McNamara had instituted a program called Project 100,000, which was lowering the standards. Basically, so as a lot of people, um, uh, particularly um, African-American political leaders said then, it was just he simply wanted to get cannon fodder. He wanted to get more black people into the war. And um, um, whatever, um, Paul Meadlow was farm kid, white farm kid from a, a southern a place called New Goshen, Indiana, which is south of Terre Haute, which is south of Indianapolis, which is south of Chicago. And he's there, and Milo says, shoot him, and he puts clip after clip into his bullet and sprays and sprays one clip after another clip. Some of the African-American and Hispanic kids shot. Nobody would dare not shoot, but shot up, just shot in the air. But they didn't, they didn't, they just said, hey. But a lot of kids shot. And there was a moment in this when, um, uh, after it was over, uh, some, there was a noise and some mother at the bottom of the pit, one of the pits, and there are photographs of it, Life magazine eventually got some, one of the kids took pictures and they were published after my stories, they, they made them public. And um, a kid crawled up through the mess, a little boy, about three, full of blood, and began screaming, of course hysterical, began running across the field or whatever there is, the open area. And Callie said to Milo, he'd been his most dependable shooter, he said, plug him. And Milo couldn't do it. So Callie took his carbine, officers then had smaller rifles, took a carbine and ran up behind the kid. Everybody, I think I talked to 55 of the kids who were there over the next year, shot him in the back of the head. The next morning, Milo early, while beginning the day, walking the first patrol, stepped on a mine and blew off his foot right below the knee and began to scream. God has punished me, Callie, and he's going to punish you. God has punished me, and he's going to punish you. The kids couldn't wait, the other kids. It was an oath. The kids couldn't wait for the chopper to come and take him away, and finally it did, and they medevaced him out. And repressed knowledge, I guess. I'd been doing the story for a couple of weeks, talking to kids, going one-to-one -one when I first picked up on it a year and a half later. As a freelance writer working for an anti-war dispatch news service, little anti-war news service, it's to the credit of the press that I could take it into the straight press. And it were mainstream press, we call it now, and it got out. Um, but one of the kids finally told me about Milo, and I, and I called up and found him in the phone book, and then I talked to his mother that day. It was an evening. And she said, I don't know, in this twang. She said, I don't know if he'll talk to you. And she said, I don't know. I said, I'm coming. So I went down. I flew down to any, I drove down. And there was no, uh, what are those computer searches called? You know, what do they call those searches? MapQuest. I mean, believe me, finding this farm. Yeah, it was on a small farm outside this town, and I finally found it, the farm. And this is not, um, I always think of the Norman Rockwell. Remember that guy who used to paint these beautific photographs of paintings of Saturday Evening Post stuff of farm life? This was really down and grungy. This was a chicken farm with uh, no care. Even the chickens looked pretty sad. The, the shack was sad. And I pull in, and she comes out. She's 50, maybe. There's no man around. And she's 50, the mother, and, and, and she looks... She looks 70, weathered, and hard scrabble. And I go up and I introduce myself, and I say, I want to talk to him. She says, he's in there. I don't know if I'll talk to you. And I said, well, I'll try. And she said, well, go ahead. And then, you can't invent this. She says, I gave them a good boy, and they sent me back a murderer. OK? Flash forward 35 years. 
I'm doing up a grape. And I did three stories. It was sort of the same sort of stuff. The press sort of just watched and let me do it. And you know, fame, fortune, glory, I got no complaints. Um, but so I'm doing these stories, and one of the things I do with the New Yorker, which I do with Happy because they're, they're, they're fine to me, they let me, you know, they're great, um, is um, when I have stories that are hot and I'm on television, I do it. I go on, talk, to, talk about it, pimp it out, or whatever I call it. And so I'm on some NPR show. Uh, would be the NPR of today, would be the NPR of 20 years ago, but we've got Amy Goodman, so it's okay. Um, no, she's. Let me tell you something. She's a professional and she works it. She works it. I know she works it. She doesn't, it's not by accident. She works. She's a, a very hardworking person and uh, doesn't talk to anybody unless she learns as much as she can about them, um, which is something, you know. A anyway, um, so I'm on this talk show and I get this call on some NPR show and some woman says, I've got a child that went there and she's in trouble. What do I do? And so I, 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 I say on air, I say, get a pencil. You got it? She says, yeah. And I say, 202, I give my number real quick because I don't want anybody else to call me. And they, the station got a lot of calls. People said, what's that number? And two days later, she called. I didn't think she would have when she didn't call the first day. This was back in Washington. The show was in New York. And she calls, and, and I go see her. She's a Catholic family from um, lower middle class family north in, in, in that area. The, re, re, you know, the child was in the 372nd unit. And what happened is, as I didn't know, that is, if you remember this, the sequence, the war starts in 03. Uh, in September, there's troubles. They start jacking up the intelligence. They wanted to get more out of the people. That's why they start the funding games, allegedly, to get better intelligence. Um, and the, the complaints made in January and May, the story of 04, it's broken. In March of 04, that unit's sent home. Uh, a complete computer, the, the army officials have gone through everybody's computer, pulled out everything. You know there's litigation going on about the photographs. And in any case, this little ACLU wants them. And they've won court decisions, but the Army's fighting bitterly to keep all of the photographs from that, from that prison from being public. And you'll hear why in a minute. And so I go see her, and here's the story. The kid sent back in March, different kid, disconsolable, irritable, uh, absolutely incapable of dealing with anybody in the family, has a marriage she breaks up, has a family she breaks away from, moves to another town, night job, the whole cliche. Nobody can figure out what's going on. The family's half hysterical. Abu Ghraib comes out about 10 weeks later, and the mother knocks on the door one night at the daughter's apartment, or if she is a daughter. I'm fudging a little bit, but that's okay. The, the story's within parameters to the word. And, and um, shows her a newspaper. It's all over the newspaper. She slams the door. And at that point, the mother, as she's telling me this story in this, uh, in, you know, a Hooters or something like that in this town. And, as she's telling me, and so at that point she said, I went and I remembered I had given my daughter a, 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 a portable computer to take to the war because it turns out um, a lot of families did it because they had DVD players that they can watch movies, which makes a lot of sense. And we're not talking about somebody who's aware of the unconscious or Freud. Um, she thinks she was absolutely no connection between Abu Ghraib and her concerns and getting that computer. She said she just wanted to get a second computer and she remembered it. And she started going through it, deleting files, and there's a file called Iraq, and she hit the button. Out came a hundred photographs, digital, of something no mother should ever see. Do you remember the New Yorker picture, the iconic picture of the, uh, the, the prisoner like this, naked, two dogs, one at each side. He's got to keep his hands behind his head. He can't even use his hands to protect the private parts. He's there with two dogs snarling. Well, in the sequence, of course, and by the way, to the ever, everlasting credit of the New Yorker and the sensibilities of the editors there, particularly um, the main editor, Dave Remnick, enough is enough for the Arab world. We're just going to show this one picture. The message is there. It's not about sensationalism or not wanting to do it. It's about how much do you disrespect the Arabs that we're fighting. And it was a real big, tough issue. In the photographs, of course, the dogs attacks the boy, the young soldier or the young prisoner. Blood all over. He attacks him in a sensitive spark, part. And the worst thing is, in the end, you can see a hand in the last picture, sewing up a big gash, blood all over the place. I mean, it was it's something no mother should see. So after some back and forth, there's all sorts of all sorts of issues. Obviously, you know, as a journalist, my God, crisis intervention is needed. What do you do as a as a human being? You know, she really needs this daughter's in trouble. I mean, serious trouble. There's also you've got to get an okay to run these pictures. They're hers. So we go through a lot of hurdles, and pictures run. I don't know and crisis and there is something, there was some intervention. Um, 
the, the reason somebody like me worries about it is, is just um, uh, is the obvious reason. I don't want to be in a position of anybody thinking that somehow I induced this. You know what I mean by getting treatment. I, I have a lot of worries that I have to really be very, very careful. Um, um, and yet I, you have to do something. You have to get her to get that child into some care, some immediate crisis care, which I, I don't know that it happened, but I, I, I found ways to get that message to her through other people's in the family, other family. Anyway, so three or four months later, she calls back and she says, well, there's something I meant to tell you about it, about uh, that I couldn't tell you then. She said, the child was quite beautiful, came back, still beautiful. But in those months after she came back, and particularly after Abu Ghraib became known, she would go out every weekend and get large tattoos, most of them very dark black, blue tattoos all over her body. And eventually, she filled up all of the space, just about all of the space. I can't, I don't know about the face. All of the space, she said body, with tattoos. And the mother said to me, it's as if she wanted to change her skin. So. What I posit to you is this, as bad as it is, as I said, uh, the war is not going to get better. Uh, what we're going to do after the next year is we're going to have an election, we're going to get an election that's going to be as meaningless as the first election, as you clear, we clearly have problems that transcend the notion of democracy. We're going to start, we're going to start pulling down troops. We're probably, and all I'm just telling you this again without, it's not empirical, it's my understanding and belief we're going to replace the troops with bombing. We're going to, as we remove troops, we're going to bomb. We're going to increase the bombing. There's been an enormous increase in bombing, particularly in the, in the Sunni Triangle right now. And you're, for the first time, you're beginning to see systematic reports of air bombs killed in, in the Sunni heartland, most of them in, in, uh, in one of the provinces towards um, Anbar province, where there's, there's very little control um, um, outside of the military bases. The insurgency controls many things. You're going to see. Um, as the troops be reduced, you're going to see the American bombs replacing it. You're seeing more and more stories, shades of body count of Vietnam, 70 insurgents killed yesterday. What you don't see is in the Arab press, El Hyatt, I would commend you as any paper, as, any, as respectable as any paper this, in this country, El Hyatt and some of the other networks, not only Al Jazeera but other networks, the, day, the same day we're reporting 70 dead in an insurgent attack, they're, they're showing who's in the hospital, children, women, and the Arab world seeing this. And right now, it's the ultimate battle, I also predict, is not going to be between uh, be, 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 you know, jihads and you know, between Al-Qaeda and the Americans. Here's what's happening. 90% of the Arab world is Sunni. Sunnis don't like Shia. They, don't, they worry about the Shia and control in, in Iran. They don't want to see Shia control extend into large parts of, of Iraq in the south, Basra, et cetera, where it's a conceded that the Shia are going to have enormous control, that is Iran. And what you're seeing is, you're not being told, but I can tell you, every serious major construction company and corporation in the Sunni world is given money to the insurgency. And the battle's becoming between the Sunni world and us on the other side. And that's the struggle. And the goal is not no longer, I think, to get us out of Iraq. The goal is going to be to get us out of the Middle East. And in Vietnam, we lost 58,000. And they always say, it's my favorite statistics, between one and two million Vietnamese, as if there's not much difference, but I leave you to, the, to that notion. Now, war brings out the worst in terms of dehumanization of the other side. That's always true. And one of the things we all know now is we don't, we don't fight them any better than any other army, any other real army. We don't fight them any better than the Krauts or the Nips or, or the, you know, any time in or the Chinese. We're, we can be just as rough as anybody else. And so, um, but, uh, what's going to happen um, uh, in the future is, is uh, uh, in terms of Vietnam, as uh, we had this terrible struggle, stupid beyond belief, five years after that war, we're playing Monopoly with the, with the Democratic Republic of Vietnam. Come build hotels, let's tourist there, it's a great place. Um, if anybody has read that wonderful book on um, enduring, Embracing the Feet by John Gower about the Japanese after World War II, the Harvard historian about how the Japanese embraced the feet. Well, they've embraced, they embraced victory, Democratic Republic of Vietnam. Here we are in the Middle East, and we have put ourselves into a strategic war with a, a, a population of two billion people who, who in the beginning 
had nothing in the Muslim world. There was an enormous amount of affection, particularly among the young, for American values, American clothes, particularly in Iran, among other places. Well, the young were very pro-American. We, this president, has so completely turned around where we are and so put all of us in jeopardy, and I'll tell you why. And I'm not, you know, I always say this, I'm not peddling downers or uppers, rather. And, you know, I'm not selling pills in the corner to make you feel better. We are seeing among the, you know, as I said, it's an indigenous war, but there is a second generation. What you saw in England was very interesting and very worrisome to a lot of smart people, and there are a lot of smart people in our government, because you saw um, Pakistani citizens who were born in England, UK citizens, going uh, to Pakistan, getting some training and coming back and, and, and blowing up the subway, those kids on 7-7. The other group was just a bunch of copycats two weeks later. And what you're seeing now are second generation kids, um, Islamic kids, uh, jihadists from Europe, mostly um, a lot of them, their parents, were, their parents were, came from North Africa, they were born in France, they were born in Germany, they were born in Brussels. They have um, education, they have good English, they have a European passport, they can get here. And we're picking them up, we're seeing more of them. That's the next, you know, it doesn't mean it's going to be the end of America. Uh, but the idea that because if nothing has happened there, we're safer is an absolute fallacy. We are approaching a, another situation. It's not going to be the end of America and we'll resolve it. And, but to reverse it is going to be enormously difficult. And the question is, we first have to come to grips with what's going on. And it's very hard to do. And um, um, uh, I can, um, um, I, I, I'm just sharing my worry. And if you sense some anxiety here, I'm really scared. I, I, don't, I don't think he'll do Syria because I think the Israelis in their wisdom Believe it or not, in this case, no, that's not. The Israelis have an existential threat. That's Iran. They see our, a nuclear-armed Iran as an existential threat. Don't ask me why. They have five, 600 weapons. But they're, for the Israelis, that's it. That's Mecca. That's, and I just don't know what Bush will do. Uh, it's so illogical to do anything. Uh, on the other hand, um, I just don't know. And we don't know. And we don't know what happens if it gets bad. We don't know what happens. Um, um, maybe we'll have Cheney in trouble. Maybe that'll change some of the dynamics. But I was very, I commend all of you, not commend, I, with great worry, read Condoleezza Rice's testimony last Thursday before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, supine or prone, most of the senators, um, no real aggression, but she was saying we could go 20 years or 10 years in Iraq and we have to take on Syria and, and war is, she's always said war may be a solution, it's not always the worst solution. She's, I think she's, she's lobbying for the next wave, I guess she knows the indictments are coming. I don't know. Um, I say that pretty seriously. She's you know, obviously auditioning. So well, let's do some horrible questions to the horrible stuff I tell you. Um, I don't know. Um, I, uh, yeah, well. We had Rob come up now and thank you. Um, OK, um, anybody who didn't pass their questions up here can do them now, and Rob Gunnison from the Journalism School will um, We're deal this, with them. We'll make this short, yeah. We've got 15 minutes. Yeah. And uh, you're going to go out there and sign oh, some yeah, books? Oh, yeah, if they want. If they yeah. Make it. yeah, they're selling uh, some of Sai's books out in the lobby, and he will do a book signing in about 15 minutes after the question period. So go out and buy some books and get them autographed. Um, we'll do 15 minutes, no more. For you diehards. You want me to read these to you? No, we'll just, just give me them and I'll read them. We'll just do it expedited. Okay. Oh my, I can't read this. I can, I can, I, I, uh, Small type. Uh, Small summer, summer before last presidential election, you were on Michael Krasny's uh, radio program, and a caller asked, What will happen if Bush gets reelected? Will we lose our democracy? You and Krasny made dismissive noises and said, even if Bush gets reelected, it will not be the end of our democracy because our institutions are stronger than that. Why do you believe this? <laughs> I'm not responsible for everything I say. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> I disavow it. Um, um, I, I actually still think, um, as I just said, I think somehow out of the woodwork comes Fitzgerald. And, um, um, and I, everything I hear about him is that he's okay. You know, he's, he's a, a, absolutely a dedicated civil servant, public servant. I wouldn't want to be prosecuted by him, though. Let's go. Okay. Take the mic, though. Why don't you grab this mic so people can hear the question? Okay. 
I, I've you, got my mic oh, on. Go do it, yeah. You, you said, while you were speaking, you said it's not about Judy Miller, it's about the New York Times. What did you mean by that? Well, I mean, the, you know, the, the, there's such... Um, I worked there for seven, eight years, and um, it's a terribly important institution. The New York Times is by any standard. It's a, it's a, as I say, it's, it's has a, it has an imperative, it has an obligation, it has to, it's the buffer between us and a presidency like the one we have, and when they fail, and I say jokingly, but I'm less and less convinced it's a joke, the problem at the Times is at the very top with the publisher and the senior editors, and none of them had the courage to go to, none of them could go, and the publisher clearly protected her, and so at this point I say that here's the New York Times, it's a huge company, they own, you know, um, 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 uh, Internet, they own uh, computer companies, they own cable companies, they own a lot of property in Canada, some water, some uh, paper mills. Um, it's a big company. Why not just spin off the New York Times as somebody who can run it? Spin it off. Let the corporation spin it off. I mean, I just don't know. It seems to me the, the retooling that's going to be needed to give that paper uh, where it has to be because there's tremendous people there. I work there. There's a lot of really bright, dedicated people, and they're really being uh, abused and misled um, by the top management, none of whom. We had Judy Miller was, there was not a secret about Judy Miller, who she was, where she was, all those stories. Everybody knew what she represented, what kind of reporting she did. And in, it's not just since uh, the Wilson thing, we're talking about five, six years. And nobody at that time uh, was willing to stand up to the, and they knew they were, she was protected by the top, by Howell Raines and the publisher Salzberger. Nobody could make it a point, none of the senior editors could really confront the management about this. And they let it go on, and they were afraid to deal. And that's just, um, that's not acceptable. Go ahead. Could you speak about uh, gender sex roles used to specifically uh, torture Iraqi detainees? Well, make that a better question. What do you mean? Uh, what was, how were, how were women and men, ex ex used, how were their genders used during the exploitation? And what did, was there? Oh, I don't know, actually, you know, there was, um, in the case of the men, I, I, to, give, to give the devil his due, I think, the, the, um, uh, uh, I think one of the reasons for the sexual stuff was this. Um, um, I, I think the idea was to take some of the photographs, and these are people that were not in the insurgency, young. If you remember the photographs, most of the people were young, the, the, the males. And the idea was to take photographs which, be, which would be devastating if made available to their family or schoolmates or to the, the people with whom they lived, where they were brought up in their villages, would be the end. They would be shameful. They would have to leave. Shame, as I say, being so dominant. Um, and the idea was that they would, one of the things I was told by somebody saying at the beginning, the idea was you get some photos. The Israelis had done this with some success during one of the infatadas, the second one, with some uh, leaders of the uh, Palestinian uh, jihadist movement. Um, get uh, uh, blackmail on them and tell them, look at this, you know, um, Mustafa, these photographs are going to be given to your mother and your friends unless you do this. Go home, find the insurgency, join it, and talk to us. That was one of the thoughts. That was one of the intellectual thoughts. But, and of course, you know, uh, FUBAR, if some of you know what that means, uh, <laughs> fucked up beyond all means or whatever it is. That everything all recognition. Gets all recognition. Yeah. It never got anywhere. And I don't know how serious it was, but that was one of the intents was you're going to maybe do. That was the best explanation I could have from anybody about what the intent was behind it. A lot of it probably comes, well, there, you know, it's, it's, it's taught in the Special Forces books. If you go back to some of the books that were taught at Fort Bragg, the American Special Forces, particularly in the in the uh, 70s and 80s, some of the books there talked about uh, using sex in, against uh, Arab men and also in the Latin America using sex against them. In other words, humiliating them sexually as a technique for interrogation. It's been taught. We've been pretty good exporters of this kind of stuff. Does Bush really want to bring democracy to the Middle East or is oil the goal? Well, he brings his definition of democracy. Look, it makes no sense. I wish, you know, I always say, here's Kissinger who, you know, lies like most people breathe and I really wish he were here. I want Kissinger here, because if Kissinger were here now, you'd know there's some long-range oil deal going or something. With Bush, I really do believe in his addled way, because of course democracy is only democracy where he wants it. He doesn't want democracy in, in Pakistan or in Saudi Arabia or in Egypt. He wants democracy where he wants it. You know, my, my government does stuff. We did, a, we did a coup three months ago in Mauritania on the basis of democracy. Not reported, but we were definitely and deeply involved in it. 
um, because the idea was you wanted to, you know, you had a leader that was aggressive and tough, and if he stayed in there, he was a controlling leader, you would build up fundamentalism, and so the idea was let's overthrow him so you won't get a fundamentalist state. That was the rationale. Democracy. They even, that one they even briefed the Congress. What motivates Rumsfeld? This is like um, you know, questions. Uh, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I, you know, I, I'm really much less interested in Rumsfeld. I will tell you that uh, it, there is the three players are. Uh, he's never going to get fired. He'll go if he goes. He'll go of his own volition. It's Cheney, Bush, and Rummy, and then even Condi's not a major player when it comes to this. The, the three, the big three, are Cheney, Bush, and Rummy, and they're together in this all the way. And what I mean by in this all the way, it's it's my firm belief that, and Fitzgerald may begin to unravel some of this. That this going to war um, was decided. This administration decided to go to war. Many, you know, this is something I probably will write a book about at whenever it gets to be to time. But this, you know, it's just hard to do right now because there's other things. But um, they probably decided to go to war um, by early 2002, which meant they spent a year not telling us the truth. And that's very serious. If true, it's very hard to establish because it's such a small circle. But there's an awful lot of, uh, you know, I, 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 I've been talking to people on this for three, four years, and collecting, and there's just no question. That's when basic decisions were made. Yes, there's a question about it. It's not empirical. But if so, that's, you're talking about a, a really a conspiracy to put us in an enormous jeopardy. And I, I, you know, let's go on. Is there, what are the chances that Bush Sr. and his moderate uh, friends will clamp down and force a more rational policy? <laughs> let's, let's go on. <laughs> Well, where is Scrocroft in that crowd in all of this? Where, do they have any influence? Well, Scrocroft, actually, to his credit, you know, he was in the New Yorker this week saying some, some interesting things. And also, and it was, I was glad to see it. And um, also, about two or three years ago, he wrote a piece in the Wall Street Journal that was quite good, in which he laid out an opposition. So he's, he's not been afraid in his own sort of way to, to do things. Uh, you know, it's, it, these, these guys are so deep in the national security state that even to say as much as that is, is heresy. Why isn't there as much publicity about Guantanamo as there has been about Abu Ghraib? Well, we don't have pictures. No. It's bad. Guantanamo is very bad. Um, um, Guantanamo, um, when I first learned about all this stuff, when I began to ask questions about it, as you remember, I, somebody told me in December of 03 about it, and I, that's one reason I began to get some questions. And there were a couple of senators, very senior senators, who of course don't want to be named, who learned early, Guantanamo was set up after, when the Afghan war began, right after the war, because there were so many prisoners being collected. And it was so clear so many of them had nothing to do with terrorism, uh, or acts against the United States. They were just there. There were men 70 and 80 years old living in their own excrement. There was really horrible mess. And so a couple of senators went down in about June, and they saw, they knew it was a Potemkin village. And so it was widely known that there were really serious problems. And I talked to kids at one point, a bunch of kids in the Marines. Remember that movie, A Few Good Men? Well, that, that unit, there really is, the Marines do run it. And there are three basic companies that serve, three, they rotate, uh, that serve as the prison guards, uh, as serve as security officials. They're not prison guards. They, they just serve as, they, they, they're the outside sort of guys. And when, in talking before any of this stuff hit the press, and talking to guys who work the prison thing, here's the thing that was amazing to me. Rules, regulation, all the stuff that we read about, that, you know, that Rumsfeld prescribed this, you could beat him three times this way and with the back of the hand this way and this way, all these rules that can make. There was no rules. Nobody knew anything about rules. You just did what you wanted to them. You had to be careful not to kill them, but you could do anything else you wanted to them. And across the board, there was never a thought there was any limit. And how can you have a policy that's in Guantanamo that's in Bagram, that's the, one of the bases where they had a prison, an air base where they had a prison in Afghanistan. Um, it's, in, it's in Iraq. It's in every prison. That, and the, uh, meanwhile, you're, all, you're already having this notion of, uh, of uh, rendition. You've already staked out this notion that the United States, because of its concern about the global war on terrorism, can go with its agents, not always in military, not always, un, sometimes just being paid as outside guys in the CAA, nothing you want to do more, get out of the agency, get four or five together, set up a company, and you're making three, four times as much as you did in the inside, doing off the books. Here's what's really the next generation. This is the stuff I'm sort of working on right now, except they've moved it off the books. In other words, if you run operations, covert operations, particularly targeted operations, off the books, you don't have to tell Congress where do they get the money. I'll tell you where they get the money. 
three and a half billion dollars they found in Saddam's money, along with nine billion dollars in oil money we have, that the military still have a great deal of control. You don't need an Iran Contra. The problem with Iran Contra, they had to go, they had to lie. They had to sell arms, you remember, to generate a couple of million dollars to get involved in, in buying the freedom because they couldn't go to Congress for the money and they didn't have the cash. We're swimming in cash in Iraq. We found 17,000 square feet underground of money that Saddam had kept. 20s, most, all 20s. And what I'm telling you now, 17,000 square feet, for some weird reason, 20s. 17,000 square feet of 20s, it came to billions. And they're not talking about it, they have it. It's, you know, it's sort of play money. Two more. Two more. Why did Tony Blair support the Bush administration on Iraq the way he did? He's got, he's got God talking to him as much as Bush does. No, I'm, no, 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 wait. Don't laugh about it. It's pretty probably, he's, he's very committed. He's, he, he, I think he really does have a fundamental streak in him. I don't know, you know, people talk to me more and more about Bush. Um, people who haven't said anything talk to me more and more about, you know, faith-based war. <laughs> Um, I, I'm afraid that may, be, that may be true. I can also tell you he got a lot of heat from the Christian right with the new constitution because it does nothing for Christians. So that's, you know, it's a whole other world out there we don't know much about. And here's one I like. What is the ticket out? What is the ticket out? I did a debate, or not, I did a conversation with Scott Ritter the other day, and I said to him, the first question was, I said, okay, I, here's how I see it. I said, you know, you're, you're a Marine, you, you know, you're willing to die for your country, you did all these things, and he does, he really means it when he said he's willing to die for his country. And I said, what I said was, I see two options. Option A, we get all the troops out by midnight tonight. Option B, we get them all out by midnight tomorrow night. I don't see any other option. The faster the better. There's no, let, let, me, let me just take it one more step. The, the, the 200 octane fuel that drives it is us. And if there's any chance for those people to start talking to each other in some rational way, it's probably too late. As I said, we blew our chances to talk to the insurgency. The insurgents were desperate to talk to us. There was some contact with some CIA people in the insurgency, some of the insurgent leaders. They have tremendous control. I'm telling you, that day of peace on, that, on Consti the, the Constitutional Election Day was not because the insurgency decided that they were afraid of the American threats and it was tougher to operate, because they made a conscious decision to let's have a day off and let's see if we can run an honest election. They were very upset when the election wasn't honest and they've gone hot, hot and angry into the UN, which has so far not been, hasn't ratified it. I'm sure that nothing will happen because it's all, it's all meant for here, domestic inception anyway. I think all of the exit plans that he has right now, removing troops and replacing with bombing is aimed at the 06 election and even they're planning, they're going past it. They're doing a lot of planning for getting out by 08 too because I, th I don't think Bush wants to leave it for, he wants his mission to be continued by the next president, a Republican. And so here we are, Republican Senate, Republican House, Republican President, Republican Supreme Court. Um, and, you know, we've had better days. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you very much.